This is the second video in a series of two to get ready for the 3.1, 3.3 quiz in calculus. And this just takes another variety of questions. This one only has two slides because the first, as you can see, has multiple parts. So what we have here is we have a function. It's a cubic function. And we have a closed interval. And the first question wants to find the extrema in the interval. So this goes back to what we did in the beginning of the chapter, a closed interval. We're going to end up having to use a table for this one. First thing I need to do is find any critical values that exist in the interval. So my derivative is 3x squared minus 12x plus 9. I'm going to pull out a 3, giving me x squared minus 4x plus 3. I'm going to factor a little bit further. And I get critical values of 1 and 3. Now, if you look in the interval that I'm working with, I don't care about 3 right now. I still want to know that it's a critical value. That's going to help me in parts B and C. But for this particular closed interval, I'm not going to count it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make an xy table. And in my xy table, I should have the endpoints and any critical values that fall inside the endpoints. So I have negative 1. I also have positive 1, because that was my critical value. And I have 2. I'm not putting 3 in, because I don't care for part A about anything other than what's in this interval. I need to find the y values that go with these x values. I'm looking for the highest one to give me my maximum and the lowest one to give me my minimum. To save yourself time, especially if it's a big table, you could use your calculator to help you here. So I actually already went and did this. I went to my calculator, and in y equals, I entered the function that we're looking at now, x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x plus 2. And then I'm going to go to the table, which is second graph. And just to help me fill in this table, because you'll notice, Everything that I need is going to be in this table. I need to know what happens when I put negative 1 in. I need to know what happens when I put positive 1 in. And I need to know what happens when I put 2 in. And it's all in my table. When I put negative 1 in, I get negative 14. When I put positive 1 in, I get 6. Calculator always goes away as soon as I touch my screen. So I have to keep popping it back up, but you'll have it in front of you. And then when I put 2 in, I get 4. So these are all values coming from plugging the x value directly into your function. Now, if you're not allowed to use your calculator in a problem like this, you would have to plug it in by hand. I am looking for the highest and lowest. Here is my lowest, so this is my minimum. And then my highest, this is my maximum. It is possible to have more than one minimum, more than one maximum. You can have a tie. But you're always going to have at least one of each as long as you're working with a continuous function on a closed interval. Part B is taking the exact same function, but now I want to know when it's increasing or decreasing over all the real numbers. So I don't care about this, interv this interval anymore. Right now, this negative 1 to 2 doesn't matter for Part B. I want to look at it like I did the problems in Section 3.3. Nice thing is, I already did a lot of the beginning work. I already know my critical values because I already derived it. So my critical values, just rewriting what I have up above, are at 1 and 3. So I'm going to set up my intervals to go from negative 1 to 3, and excuse me, negative infinity to 1, 1 to 3, and 3 to infinity. So I save myself a little time since I'm using the same function as I was in part A. Now I want to plug values into my derivative in each interval. So if I plug 0 into my derivative, and the nice thing is it's right up, up here that I'm looking, I get a negative times a negative, which is a positive, so that means it is increasing. And again, you're welcome to abbreviate, but you have to put the increasing. You can't just rely on a plus sign. That plus sign will have a different meaning in a couple sections. Now when I look from 1 to 3, I'm going to pick 2. If I put 2 in, I get a negative times a positive. So that is negative, meaning it is a decreasing interval. And then if I pick any number bigger than 3, I'm going to get a positive across the board. So this function has two intervals that it's increasing and one interval that it's decreasing. And then finally, part C wants to know the extrema over the real numbers. This is j now dealing with exactly what you did up above. Again, don't care about the interval negative 1 to 2. We're throwing that out. We are looking over the, all the real numbers, and we already did almost all the work. I can look up above and know that since it's increasing and decreasing, that I'm going to have a maximum at 1. And I know since it's decreasing to increasing, I'm going to have a minimum at 3. I need to get the y values to go with it. Well, I actually already know that 1 because I did that up here, if you look right here, I know when I plug 1 into the original equation, I get 6. 3, if you, can't, if you don't have calculator access, you could just plug it in, in, in your head. It's going to take a little while. Because I do already have my calculator up, I can look and see that when x is 3, y is 2. So that gives me my y coordinate. And there is my minimum. There is my maximum. Make sure you give the full point. It is not just an x. It is an x, y, because it is something that you're able to graph. And then the last problem to help you review for the quiz is a visual problem. 
from the very beginning of the chapter, we started talking about where we have minimums, maximums, absolute minimums, relative minimums. And I just want to kind of walk through that. I have this closed interval of kind of a strange looking function here. And I have five points illustrated, A, B, C, D, and E. And I just want to discuss and describe each one what's happening. If you look at point A, um, this, is, this is an endpoint. It is closed. However, it is not a minimum, nor is it a maximum, because it is not a peak or a valley, and it is not the highest or lowest point on my graph. So this is, if we were asking minimum, maximum to describe, this is neither or nothing. B. B should be a maximum. It actually should be an absolute maximum. However, it's not defined there. So this is also neither. This is neither a mi minimum nor a maximum because of the open circle. If that point that should be the highest isn't there, we do not have that maximum. Point C, that is going to be a relative minimum. It is a valley kind of in our graph, but it is not the lowest point, so it is not an absolute. D is a relative minimum. It is a peak on my graph, or excuse me, a relative maximum, so that backwards, relative maximum. It's a peak on my graph. It is not the highest point on my graph, so I don't call it an absolute. It is just a relative maximum. And then finally, E. It's not a relative maximum minimum. However, it is the lowest point you ever see on this graph in this closed interval. So this is the absolute minimum. Another way that questions like this were asked is you had a series of questions in the book where just asking yes or no, does it have a minimum, does it have a maximum? When it's asking that question, it's really looking for the absolutes. This one would have a minimum, it would not have a maximum because even though there is a relative maximum, the actual highest point is not defined there. It's an open circle. So here's a visual on everything else we had done so far had been more algebraic in nature. So it's kind of nice to see one that is more picture represented.